What's up guys, Randis Reviews here with you again. In this video, we're gonna be doing a rundown of the bolt action rifles from the Axis Powers in World War II. If you like these military surplus videos, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up because that helps the channel out with the algorithm. And if you want to continue seeing all of my future videos on surplus rifles, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. So this is my most recent Milserp acquisition. This is a German carbiner 98K, the quintessential World War II Mauser. No World War II rifle collection is complete without one. No Mauser rifle collection is complete without one. And in honor of me adding this awesome rifle to my collection, I thought it would be a pretty cool idea to go over all of the bolt guns in my collection that were used by the Axis Powers. Since we already have the K98 out, we'll talk about it first. The K98 was the primary infantry arm of Nazi Germany in World War II. They made a ton of these. I believe the production numbers on K98s by the end of the war were in the neighborhood of 15 million, close to it at least. The Car 98K is of course chambered in the extremely powerful some would say overpowered 7.92 by 57 millimeter or 8 millimeter Mauser cartridge. My particular example has an arsenal code for Gooseloff. The date of production on this particular rifle is 1943. That puts it in sort of the later part of the mid war. So it does have a laminated wood stock. The H band up front is still the original style H band before they were crudely stamped out. It does have a stamped trigger guard and a cupped butt plate. The sling on my particular rifle is actually. Actually, Yugoslavian. I just threw that on there and it works well enough. I picked this rifle up from the most recent gun show I attended. This rifle did come with a bayonet. You can see the price tag on that bayonet right there was $180. These regularly fetch that much on eBay. I ended up getting them to take the price on the bayonet down to $100. Now the bayonet is non-matching to the rifle. It is a 1937 date and the serial number on the bayonet is not matching the serial number on the sheath but it's in fairly good condition. Now, unfortunately, my rifle does have non-matching serial numbers on most of the parts. The bolt is most certainly non-matching. All the Wampanoaks are still there and unmolested. The bore on this rifle, though, is excellent. That is what made me pull the trigger and throw down the cash on it. So that was the first and possibly the biggest check off of our Access Powers bolt guns list, getting Germany out of the way early. Now let's move this over to a more Mediterranean part of Europe and check out those Italian rifles. Now, by the time World War II rolled around, Italy had so many different Carcano models in service that they really deserve a video all their own. So for the sake of time, we're gonna keep this to three rifles, a long rifle, a short rifle, and a carbine. But keep in mind, there were several other carbine versions of the Carcano, as well as another short rifle version, and your old school M91 long rifles were still around in limited numbers. Firstly here, we have a M9141. These rifles were produced from 1941 until Italian capitulation in the war. My particular example was manufactured in 1943. These rifles are chambered in the 6.5 by 52 millimeter cartridge and they are a throwback to the older style adjustable sights that you'll see on many carbine models of the Carcanos before they changed over to a more simple fixed sight. The M9141 no longer has gain twist rifling like the older M91 Carcano does, which was the original Carcano. On the lead up to World War II and in the interwar years, Italy came to the realization that that gain twist rifling, starting the rifling with a larger twist rate and tightening it up as you go down the bore, really didn't do much to extend the barrel life. It just added complexity to the manufacturing. So they did away with that for the most part on their later Carcano designs. This rifle will accept the standard M91 Carcano bayonet. Four sights, it has a V-notch in the rear and a blade sight up front. Just like any Carcano, it loads using six round Mamlucker style M-block clips. And as far as my Carcano goes, this is probably the nicest one in my collection condition wise. Fantastic bore great looking wood, fantastic bluing. I got pretty lucky when I stumbled on this one at a gun show. Moving down in size a little bit, we have what was supposed to be 
Italy's standard infantry arm, but due to them being pushed into the war a little earlier than I think they planned on, they ended up fielding a large variety of different rifles. This is the Fusili Modelo 38. This is a short rifle, sort of an intermediate length, not quite a carbine, not quite a long rifle. Most of the world switched their standard infantry rifle from a full-on long rifle to an intermediate rifle. In that span from World War I to World War II, Italy was a little late to the game and didn't get theirs done until 1938, but this is the rifle that they came up with. Now, my particular example of the rifle is a very early model. Some people refer to this as a prototype rifle. It has a full-length wooden handguard. On most M38 Carcanos that you will see, the handguard will stop about here, and you'll have an exposed piece of barrel and an extra barrel band in the middle. Mine doesn't have that, which makes this particular example a little extra interesting. Now, the M38 was initially designed to use the new updated 7.35 by 51 millimeter cartridge. Italy was not exactly happy with the ballistics of their 6.5 millimeter cartridge. They wanted something with a little bit more oomph. And so they decided to move to a 30 caliber cartridge similar to what the rest of the world was using. That was their intentions, but it didn't quite pan out. The same way they didn't get to convert the whole army to using the M38 as the standard infantry arm. They were also pushed into the war before they had proper manufacturing and logistics capabilities to really supply a military with that round. And so they ended up reverting back to the old 6.5 cartridge anyway. And that's one of the reasons that so many Carcano models did stay in service. And the last of the three Carcanos we're gonna be looking at is a carbine. This is a M38 carbine. These are referred to as the cavalry carbine because they have this very cool folding bayonet. Now these rifles were originally designed to be used on horseback and that's why they have a folding bayonet. And Italy did have some cavalry and these rifles were used that way. But these also ended up in the hands of a lot of regular soldiers and especially people that had jobs other than being a infantrymen, so like drivers, messengers, scouts. So these rifles really got around. Now this one is chambered in that 30 caliber 7.35 cartridge that we just talked about on the other M38. There are also 6.5 caliber versions of both the M38 Cavalry Carbine and the Fusili Modelo M38. Now I'm aware that all these designations for Carcanos is quite confusing because there is seriously a lot of them. And in future videos, I will go more into depth on the individual Carcanos. My channel already has a lot of Carcano videos on it and there's some good little snippets of information in each of those videos. So if you want to check those out, I'll post a link to those down in the description of this video and you can brush up on your Carcanos a little bit. Carcanos is something that I plan to continue expanding on as our channel goes along into the future because there really is a lot of history there and very cool intricacies between each individual model of those Carcanos. And now over to the land of the rising sun, Imperial Japan, which might actually be my favorite access firearms of the Second World War. Much like Italy, Japan had several variations of their standard infantry bolt actions, but their standard infantry arm in the Pacific Theater was the Type 99 Arasaka. This is a mid-war example. These rifles are absolutely fantastic. Some of the best military bolt actions ever made. They have an extremely strong and durable action. Japanese steel, was fantastic. They are purposely built for jungle combat. For the most part, the bores are chrome lined, which helps fight corrosion. In many cases, the bolt head would also be chromed in order to help keep that corrosion away. The Arasaka is essentially a Mauser action, but it's even simplified beyond that of a regular Mauser and is even easier to produce. They have a five round, internal box magazine, which is reloaded using stripper clips. Now this is a stripper clip of 6.5. The Type 99 was actually chambered in the 7.7 millimeter cartridge. Just like the story we went over with Italy, how they switched from a 6.5 millimeter cartridge to a seven millimeter cartridge or 30 caliber cartridge, Japan did the same thing. And just like Italy, Japan ended up keeping their 6.5 millimeter cartridge in service until the end of the war as well. The Type 99 Arasaka started out as one of the most bell and whistle decked out bolt actions of all time. They very famously had rear sights that were designed for taking out aircraft. My example doesn't have the anti-aircraft sights. Unfortunately, on the early examples, this middle barrel band would have a protrusion on the bottom and a wire monopod that 
could be folded out and used to help support you in shooting. They were also issued with dust covers over the action here. Most rifles you run across nowadays no longer have the dust cover because, quite frankly, it's an easy part to lose. There's an old story of Japanese soldiers tossing them because they made too much noise. And whether or not that's true, who knows? Back to the sights. The Type 99 Arasaka uses a pretty good aperture style setup. You have your aperture peep in the rear and then the front on the early and mid-war examples like this one is a protected thin barley corn, which makes for a pretty good sight picture. For Type 99s, I also have a late war example referred to as a last ditch rifle. Comparing these two side by side, the first thing that you notice is that the wood on the mid-war example goes all the way to the nose cap. On the last ditch example, the wood stops about halfway and they were just trying to save materials. They got rid of the protective wings on either side of the front sight there. The rear sight is no longer adjustable. It's just a fixed peep. And on our mid-war example here, our butt plate is metal. On this last ditch example, the butt plate is made out of wood. Also, if you look at all of the welds and machining marks, everything on the last ditch is far more crude. They also did away with the chrome bores on many of the last ditch rifles, although you will run across some that still have that chrome bore. Even with the overall quality of the rifle degrading as the war went on, till the very end, Japan produced Arasakas that are rock solid, reliable, and completely functional and safe rifles. And they really are one of my favorite military bolt actions ever. In the Pacific, Japan was mainly fighting with the Type 99 Arasaka against American forces. But a lot of people forget that Japan was also fighting a war against China. And for the most part, Japan's army in China was armed with the older Type 38 Arasaka, which is still a full-length long rifle, much like that of the rifles of the Great War and before. The Type 38 Arasaka, like the Type 99 Arasaka, is a fantastic rifle. Japan really did a great job of producing their small arms, particularly their bolt actions. The Type 38 is chambered for the 6.5 millimeter cartridge. And like the Type 99, it is loaded using a stripper clip, five round internal box magazine, Mauser style bolt. These rifles were still used in huge numbers for Japan in World War II. And so for that reason, Japan basically has two main service arms, the Type 38 and the Type 99. The Type 38 wasn't just a long rifle. There's also a teeny little carbine version of it. And this rifle is definitely one of my favorite Arasakas. It's everything you like about an Arasaka, but far smaller and far more handy. Now, unfortunately, my example has been refinished in a way that I definitely don't appreciate. I bought this at a gun show for a very good price. Somebody in the past decided to lacquer or polyurethane the stock so it's very shiny. And unfortunately, they parkerized most of the metal parts. Like its big brother, the Type 38 long rifle, the Type 38 carbine uses that same 6.5 millimeter cartridge, and it is also loaded with a stripper clip. The last Japanese bolt gun we'll be looking at is one that I very recently did a video on, and this is my Type I Carcano. This is West meets East in a very cool Milserp fusion. This is Type 38 Arasaka meets M91 Carcano. These rifles were used in naval service. The Navy was having a hard time getting their hands on Type 99s or even Type 38s. And so they went out and contracted with Italy for some Carcano rifles chambered in the standard 6.5 millimeter Japanese service cartridge. It uses a Carcano bolt, but the magazine is Mauser style. Aesthetically, it looks virtually like a Type 38 Arasaka with slight differences. And it's sad to say, but in my opinion, of all the Carcanos made, this one's probably the best one. And I think that's because the magazine changed. You're no longer dealing with those Mamlucker clips, which if they're not absolutely perfect can cause big problems. Having that Mauser style magazine makes a big difference. There are, of course, several other Japanese bolt guns that I did not talk about in this video. That's because I don't have them in my collection to talk about them. I'm sure you guys will let me know down in the comments which Japanese rifles I still need to add to my collection. That pretty much does it for the major Axis powers, but there were members of the Axis other than your three main powers, like Romania and Hungary. Of course, Germany kind of spilled their own borders. Austria kind of became Germany. I do have another couple rifles 
that I would consider Axis rifles. So let's take it on over to those. Now, Finland wasn't really an Axis member. They were under German influence and they were at war with Russia, who was an allied power. So it puts them on that side of the conflict. This is one of my absolute favorite, most prized rifles in my collection. Not because it's particularly amazing, which it is really cool, but because it was a gift from a dear friend. This is a M91 Mosin Nagant chambered in 7.62 by 54R. I've had this rifle since before I started doing YouTube videos and it's never made it onto cam until this point. It needs some work done. So I do plan on doing some videos on this rifle in the future and we'll kind of fix the little issues that it has. But this rifle is a Finnish capture rifle. It is a New England Westinghouse Mosin Nagant, which was produced here in the United States under contract by Russia, made its way over to Russia for World War I, stuck around in the area, and at some point fell into the hands of Finland, who had two back-to-back -back wars with Russia, if you're not already aware, the Winter War and the Continuation War, which in my opinion is World War II. The Finns modified the rear sight, changing the zero, they changed the front sight, the barrel has been counterbored for increased accuracy, and at some point it lost its American walnut stock and has made its way into a two-piece finished stock with rounded joints, for those of you who may care. Finland never actually made any Mosin Nagant receivers. For every Mosin Nagant they put into service, the receiver was either bought or captured or donated to them. They had an extensive reworking program to take Soviet Mosin Nagants and bring them up to finished standards, accurizing them. There's all these different models. It's a really cool subsect of collecting. So it's really cool that I have this one in my collection. And lastly, to wrap this lengthy video up, I have a couple carbines here. These are both M95 Mamlucker straight pull carbines. Firstly, we'll check out this one. This is a Budapest M95, which of course Budapest or Budapest is in Hungary. And Hungary was officially in the Axis in World War II. These use the Mamlucker straight pull action and load with Mamlucker style M-block clips. Both of these rifles have been updated to the 8 by 56 millimeter rimmed cartridge, which was an update that most every M95 rifle or carbine went through prior to the Second World War. I picked this one up at a gun show years ago for a hundred bucks and it came with the original sling. That's an absolute steal compared to today's market. And my other M95 carbine was converted from a long rifle. So it has a full length long rifle ladder sight, but the rifle was cut down and shortened into a carbine prior to the Second World War, just like many of these rifles were. And this one is an Austrian version being made at the Steyr factory. Same Mamlucker straight pull action, this one's a little bit smoother than my Budapest one is, and it loads with that same five round Mamlucker style in block clip. These rifles were definitely showing their age by the time World War II rolled around. These are pre-World War I designs. They did their best to keep them relevant, updating them to a Spitzer cartridge, a more powerful cartridge at that. And they did a good job of taking their long rifles and cutting them down to a more manageable and practical short rifle. But even so, of every rifle we've looked at today, with maybe the exception of one of the Carcanos, I wouldn't feel very good being armed with one of these in World War II. I guess we'll finish this video up with the Access King once again, the Car 98K, the reason for this video in the first place. If you stuck around with me through this one, I truly appreciate it, guys. Don't forget to let me know what you thought about the video down in the comments. If there's a rifle that I didn't talk about that I absolutely need to add to my collection, let me know that down in the comments as well. Remember, this video was all bolt actions. Of course, there are far more access firearms than just their bolt action rifles, but I think I did a pretty good job of covering a lot of them. Of course, not all of them. If you would like to see the same kind of video, but on the Allied side, don't forget to let me know about that as well, because I suppose it would only be fair if I did cover both sides of the war. As always, hit the thumbs up for the Google algorithm, sub to the channel for all future videos, and don't forget to ding the little bell, so that way you get a notification when one of my videos go live. Thanks again for watching, guys, and I'll catch you in the next video. See you then. Peace.